This is presentation of a report produced by Stewart Technology Associates Limited for Keystone Properties LLC. The evaluation of passing ship effects in St. John's River, Florida. This is an introduction to the report we've produced for Keystone Properties on passing ship effects in the St. John's River. In this screen you can see an Orcaflex simulation running in the background. Well here's our table of contents in the report. We'll be talking a little bit about each of the things in this list, beginning with a description of the site, a definition of the problem we're solving, our technical approach towards its solution. We'll talk about the coal carrier that is the principal vessel to be moored at the new Keystone Wharf, how we've designed a mooring for it, which is a fairly optimal mooring for this type of vessel, the nature of the forces that are caused by a passing ship, how we evaluate those forces. Importantly, we'll be looking at how we've estimated the passing distances and the speeds of the ships coming by. We'll show the model we've developed in Orcaflex for this work. We'll talk about line excursions and tension results. Uh, we'll show the graphical format in the report. And we'll also, also show how we look at these forces and tensions in the time domain. A little bit about the line properties themselves. And then we get to the kind of crux of the issue, which is the safety factors against breaking any lines as a ship passes and then how we turn that into a risk assessment, which is the ultimate goal of our work here. In this view, we see an Orcaflex analysis simulation that I'm about to click this button and start the replay. In the upper right you can see a ship coming along. In the immediate foreground there is the large coal carrier. The blue block here represents the wharf. The mooring lines are shown. Fenders are shown in white where they're in contact with the side of the wharf. As the ship passes by the suction effect pulls out the moored ship. The fenders go yellow in the analysis when they're no longer in contact. The ship swings back. The other views are um, all running simultaneously. So down in this lower screen, we can see the ship still surging back and forth after the other ship has passed by. We've got wireline diagrams on the left. This is the end view with the pier here and this is the plan view uh, in a wireline diagram in the upper left hand corner. We'll come back to this several times later on in this presentation. Okay, so now we adjust the scene for where we are. We're in this area of Florida and we zoom in. We're on the east coast, the Atlantic coast of Florida, and we're close to Jacksonville. And now in this shot you can see the river that comes in from the Mayport entrance over here. Ships come around and they've got passing places in these areas. Once they get up into these difficult turns in the river, let's zoom in on that a little bit more. Let me slide this over a little. 
the channel might look wide in this picture, but in these areas particularly, the channel is not wide enough. For it to be safe in the consideration of the harbour pilots of the city of Jacksonville for equal safe passing to take place. So here you see on the screen, we've turned it around a little bit and we should be able to flick back quickly to what we showed you in the basic report, which is the way it looks on the chart, which is what you see here. Now we're going to zoom in even further to give you an idea of how close the passing ships could actually pass, which is one of the critical assessments to the risk in this project, because we're dealing with long navigation channel, special effects, and how close the ships can actually pass. Now we've zoomed in to the, the Keystone Wharf, which is existing here, and the channel the Long Branch Range down on the left-hand side of the screen and the Chaseville Turn on the right-hand side of the screen was the chart overlaid on top of a drawing beneath. We'll get rid of the chart now. Now with the chart gone, we can see the existing wharf, this red line here, and the new wharf and a crane operations area on the Keystone side. We'll now put a schematic view of a ship on this diagram. So here's the proposed coal carrier at the new Keystone Wharf. The assumption is that this grey area has all been dredged to the proposed new uh, <clears throat> channel depth of 42 feet. And here's the potential path of a passing ship that is drawn close to coming down the center of the, the channel. And it's considered to be a most likely minimum separation for the ship's coal carrier with its centre here, and that would put this container ship at a distance of 533 metres, 33 feet, I'm sorry, 533 feet. With these um, radial distances in, in feet shown for guidance. Now another scenario for the passing ship has been drawn. This time the scenario is that the pilot coming down the river, sorry, coming up the river from the, from the sea, has noticed that there is a ship moored at this berth and deliberately gives a wider passage. And so we've labeled this path as one to deliberately give wide separation. Conversely, we're showing here a scenario where the ship coming up from the sea it is much too close to the edge of the channel. Um, if it was any further up the page, he, he would be going aground. But he can just get this path, which is the path at the channel edge, and represents the minimum possible separation <coughs> that a passing ship could take. Here we've added a, a third path that we call um, path too close, uh, minimum likely separation. The ship coming from the sea is closer than prudent to the edge of the channel. He should have seen this ship moored at this berth, 
it should be further away. But I guess with the possibility for inclement weather and the stakes, um, and the possibility of having to avoid another errant ship coming in the other direction, uh, this is a possible consideration. And we'll see these terms, min possible separation, min likely separation, and most likely, se most likely minimum separation uh, on the, the charts of results. This is a picture of the Honorable Henry Jackman, one of the vessels anticipated to be using the Keystone Wharf. She's about 803 feet long. Her general particulars are shown here and should be reviewed in the report. What we're looking at here is a proposed de design for the moorings that Stuart Technology has produced. You see in red the coal carrier. This is the outline of the Honourable Henry Jackman. And we see lines one, two, and three, these blue lines, are resting lines at the bow of the ship. And lines six, seven, and eight are breasting lines at the stern of the ship, while lines four and five are spring lines. And these um, oval objects are fenders. There's ten fenders shown here. The fenders are nominally uh, 12 feet diameter and uh, 30 feet long. And dimensions are given here for the objects. But this pinkish area is, as, as shown previously on the diagrams, uh, a hard standing area for operations. Here we see an end view of the moored ship and the solid red outline is at the deepest draft considered 39 feet in a 42 feet water depth and the dotted outline shows a 10 foot draft. Important to note that at the deep draft the mooring lines have a very shallow angle to horizontal whereas at the deeper draft the lines increase their angle to horizontal um, the breasting line angles are realistic, but the spring line angles are naturally looking from the end, so don't really reflect this very steep apparent angle. The general nature of how the forces imposed on the moored ship vary with time is shown in this figure. Fx represents the longitudinal force causing the surge of the moored vessel parallel to the wharf, and Fy, the red line, represents the sway force. In the case where the red line dips down in the negative values, it's pushing the moored vessel onto the fenders, and where it raises up to a positive value, it's pulling the vessel away from the pier. Um, and this must be resisted by the mooring lines. Similarly, the X force varies positive and negative, so the two spring lines must accommodate these forces and, as much as possible, resist the motions. And following on from the the graphical view of how the forces vary. This screen shows a, a moored ship on the left with a, an approaching ship or ship moving and the force at the moment would be in the negative surge direction and in the positive sway direction. When the ship's right alongside in the middle diagram 
that the suction effect is greatest and when the ship is nearly past the uh, force is pushing back on to the ship that's moored and the surge force in the opposite direction is greatest. It's important to note that the graph we've just looked at shows forces varying with time. These forces increase as the size of the passing ship increases, they increase with the speed of the passing ship, the closeness of the passing ship, and the size of the moored ship and the size of the passing ship, uh, as well as the drafts of both ships. They're particularly sensitive to small undercule clearances, uh, more so for the moored ship than for the passing ship. The forces are the same if the moored ship is pointing in the same direction as the passing ship or if it's pointing in the opposite direction, at least as far as the calculations are concerned. Note also that the passing ship speed is relative to the speed of the current. So if there's a one knot current running in the direction of the passing ship, and the passing ship is doing eight knots over the ground, it's only really doing seven knots relative to the current. We're now back looking at the simulation in Orcaflex that we saw earlier in this presentation. And I'm going to switch the workspace to show individual graphs in the time domain indicating what each of the principal results is doing. So here we see the, um, the graphic, one, one of the graphics, then each of these small graphs represents something important. Beginning at the top here, the, the time history of vessel in the y direction. This is the surge, sorry, the sway motion of the vessel going away from the pier. This graph shows the vessel x motion. This would be the vessel moving up and down the pier or surging. This graph shows the rotation of the vessel. This would be the ship rolling as it comes up against the fenders and is stopped by the mooring lines. Then these three graphs each show the force for a fender, one at one end, another fender, and another fender. This shows the vessel, this lower graph, heave motion, very, very small, 0 0.066, uh, 0 0.072 feet. Then this group of eight graphs represents the time histories of each of the eight mooring lines. And, and we'll come back to this in just a moment. At this point in the simulation, I've stopped it at about 120 seconds. And this graph here is the vessel rotation one, which is roll. It's a small angle of less than half a degree, but it occurs at the time where these, we've, we've switched views now to a wireframe view, these breasting lines are pulled tight, and we see this breasting line one is close to its maximum value, this guy is close to his maximum value, as is this one and this breasting line is at its maximum, this breasting line is at its maximum. And we, we can just step back through this going backwards and we reach a point where the roll angle is now a minimum in this picture and we see that these breasting lines 
have no tension, no tension, no tension. That's a spring line, that's a spring line, resting line, no tension. So we see also that not only does the sway away from the pier increase the resting line tensions, but it also coincides, maximum tensions also coincide with maximum roll angle. So we play that from that point. And you see the vessel motion is quite complicated. This is one of the ways to summarize the data coming from those many graphs that we've just looked at in Orcaflex. So each of the data points on this graph represents one Orcaflex time domain analysis. We've got different drafts for the moored vessel. We've got different velocities for the passing vessel. And also the dotted lines here are a different type of mooring line. These vertical lines indicate the minimum possible separation that we talked about before and the most likely minimum separation between the passing ship and the moored ship. So results between these two lines are what we expect to be representative of how the system would perform under these different conditions. Similar to the previous graph, which was vessel surge plotted versus the passing ship separation, this shows vessel sway for a variety of different cases, with the graphs color coded in the same way to make them easier to read. Here we see the spring line tensions versus the passing ship separation. So the x-axis is the same as the previous two graphs, but this time we're looking at the tension in the spring line. So the maximum tension in either spring line is the, uh, the point for, in the brown graph case, a 39-foot draft on the moored ship and the passing ship doing nine knots. So when it's at the red line here with the separation that's the minimum possible separation, the force in the, the maximum tension in the spring lines would be around about 660 kips. And when it's at the most likely minimum separation where the green line intersects, the force in the spring lines would be around about 410 kips. And you see that as the ship separation distance is closed, there isn't much difference between a separation of 450 feet and a separation of 550 feet for the um, maximum tension induced in the spring lines. If the passing ship is only doing seven knots, which is the more likely velocity, the tension in the spring lines is around about 200 kips for the separation beyond 450 feet and at the minimum possible separation the tension would be around 300 kips. If the moored ship is only at 29 foot draft and the passing ship is doing 7 knots the forces are dramatically reduced with the maximum force at the minimum possible separation being 100 kips in the heaviest loaded spring line at any point in the simulation. Now we have the same sort of graph, but this time for the breasting line maximum tensions. Uh, again, the brown uppermost line indicates a 39 foot draft for the moored coal carrier and a nine knot passing velocity for the big passing ship. Similar trends, uh, this time the, the dotted red line we didn't mention before is for a different type of mooring line. This is an Amstel blue type of mooring line, uh, a higher technology 
fiber, then the more common polyester, all the other lines are drawn for the polyester. So, maximum tension for the red line intersecting, which is the minimum possible separation, is around 330 kips, 320 kips. And it's a bit more in this case for the Amstel blue lines. Now we're plotting the sway force caused by the passing ship versus the ship separation center to center distances. The same color coding is used and not surprisingly the trend of reducing force with distance is um, similar to the trend of reducing mooring line tensions with passing ship distance. And the faster the ship is going, 9 knots, 8 knots, 7 knots, brown, green, blue, the force decreases, decreases with decreasing speed. From the report, this picture is taken. We looked at using polyester line, double braided polyester lines, 12 inch circumference, and for the uh, breasting lines, we had two part polyester lines, and for the spring, spring lines, we had three part polyester lines, and this shows their breaking strengths. And the AE, or the, um, the, the, the stiffness in, in stretching, would be 8,000 kips for the two part polyester lines, and 12,000 kips for the three part lines. As an alternative to the polyester, we looked at a, a, a line type called Amstel Blue, which is, is much stiffer, and the, the circumference of 10 inches compared to the circumference of 12 inches has a, a breaking strength for a single part line of 906 kips compared to 470 kips for the polyester and because it is much stiffer the whole system behaves quite differently um, and this line has an advantage of having much less spring back. Details of ropes can be found in manufacturers catalogues. This is a snapshot of the mooring applications first page in the Samson catalog, Samson High Performance Synthetic Mooring Lines. Just as we've had to make assumptions in the design of this mooring system for the line properties, we have to make some assumptions about the fenders. So we've selected a uh, pneumatic fender and they look like this picture. Having selected a suitable fender from manufacturer's information, we are able to plot its load deflection curve, which is quite non-linear as shown in the red line here. And we match it with a linear approximation in Orcaflex, which is the blue line here. As noted in our report, the maximum load in any fender in our analysis was around 115 kips, so around about here. And this is less than half the maximum allowable load on this type of fender and it might, might be equated to a safety factor for significantly greater than two. But um, we're, we're in this area of the curve. Here we're really getting to the heart of the results where we're plotting in this case the spring line safety factors versus the passing ship separation 
So it's our usual x-axis, ship separation, center to center distance. But on the y-axis this time, it's safety factor against breaking a spring line. And now, with the same color convention, the brown line, which used to be the highest when we were looking at loads um, and, and motions, has become the lowest because it represents the lowest safety factor. And for the minimum possible passing distance, with the maximum speed of nine knots of the passing vessel, we have a safety factor in excess of two, both for the Amsteel blue, the dotted red line, and the double braided polyester. Um, the, the yellow vertical line here represents the minimum likely separation, if you remember back where we showed the pictures of the trajectories of the passing ships. Uh, and in this case, our safety factors are above three. And in the case of the most likely minimum separation, with, with the maximum speed of, of nine knots, brown line, um, not recommended. Um, we expect the ships to do no more than seven knots coming by. We've got a safety factor of about 3.5 for the polyester and about 3.9 for the Hamster blue lines. Um, interestingly, the 29-foot draft and a ship passing at 7 knots, we're at safety factors um, close to 14. So it, it just shows that <clears throat> the, um, the system is quite sensitive to draft um, and more so than to the speed of the passing ship. When you boil it down, to safety factors against breaking the mooring lines. Here we have the breasting line safety factors. We were previously looking at the spring lines and our lowest safety factors against breaking in, in this area with the minimum possible ship separation are now for the polyester lines round about three, slightly lower for the Amsteel blue and for the minimum likely separation, we're above four, we're close to five. Things are pretty comfortable in the worst of the worst cases. We now come to the final wrap up on this project in terms of finishing this report for you guys. And this is a basic summary of the risk we assess. Um, we've begun by determining the safety factors achieved under different conditions. And it should be stated that we could have achieved larger safety factors if we had chosen to use larger mooring lines. And it may be that the cases we've been analysing aren't as arduous as possibly the hurricane mooring case, which would dictate larger mooring lines would be needed. Anyway, the, the berthing forces are probably going to control the size of the fenders. Uh, that's another issue. We, we've seen that the lowest safety factors occur, as expected, in the most unlikely conditions. But even in this event, they exceed two. two. This is compared to a minimum that would be required under the, the most widely used mooring program offshore, which is API RP2SK, where we would be required to reach 1.67. Now, in recent studies, we've, we've found that in offshore moorings that a 10-year return period event with a, a safety factor of 1.67 uh, has a risk of failure, failure probability of around about 2 times 10 to the minus 2 or, or 2 percent and that would be in the 10-year storm and historically this has been deemed acceptable. 
But it's been found recently that by increasing the safety factor to two, it reduces the probability of failure by about a factor of five to around 0.4%. This is generally considered to be an acceptable risk for moorings when the consequence of failure doesn't result in loss of life. If we increase the safety factor to three, it's estimated to reduce the probability of failure to around 0.01%, or 1 times 10 to the minus 4. This is in the region of historical dam failures in the USA. Safety factors of greater than 4 are considered to have a probability of failure less than 2 times 10 to the minus 5, putting the risk category roughly equal to that of a dam where design a dam design where a failure would result in significant loss of life. Very, very low probability failure. So the consequences of our mooring system failure uh, are what? Um, first of all, we say that uh, if, in this case, we fail one line, just one line, the whole system is considered to have failed because we guess it could unzip. It's most unlikely that it would, but the ship breaks away. We don't think that that would result in serious damage. I mean, there would be definitely damage. Uh, we don't think there'd be pollution, and we don't think there would be loss of life. And if it was determined that the ship breaking away could result in serious damage or pollution, um, there could be mitigating measures still added to this mooring system with some extra lines to prevent the ship drifting too far away. So now let's try and put some of this into perspective. The minimum safety factor against line breakage for the mooring system designed in this report is found to be in excess of four for the condition, the scenario of a large, a very large ship, the largest we think will pass down the St. John's River, traveling at seven knots, the sensible velocity, with the minimum possible separation distance. That means the pilot something's gone wrong, he's much too close to the bank, but that, that's a safety factor in excess of four, and that puts the probability of failure, the risk of failure of the system, somewhere around the equivalent to the failure probability one builds into the design for a dam, the consequences of whose failure would kill many people enormously low risk of occurrence. And remember also that those large forces occur when the coal carrier is at its deepest possible draft, which isn't for much of the time that it's at the dock. So for the time when the draft is much less, the forces are much less, the safety factors are much larger, and the probabilities of failure are incredibly low. In increasing the setback under this scenario by 100 feet, or even by 1,000 feet, appears to have al almost zero impact on the, the, the risk of the failure occurring, because the risk is already so low that the increased setback has no effect. As we stated at the beginning, we had two objectives to this work. Firstly, to assess the reduction in risk of the coal carrier breaking away from its moorings that might be achieved by increasing the setback of the new wharf from the edge of the navigable channel. Looking at the 
forces caused by a passing vessel as being the reason for the breakaway. And secondly, to identify through numerical study the characteristics of an acceptable mooring and fendering system so that the forces could be predicted with reliability as could the resulting ship surge, sway and yaw motions. The minimum safety factor against line breakage for the mooring system designed in this report is found to be well in excess of four for a large passing ship travelling at seven knots with the minimum possible separation of 315 feet from the moored coal carrier when the coal carrier is at its deepest draft. Increasing the setback would have negligible effect on the probability of failure in this scenario. In this case, the probability of failure is estimated to be less than 2 times 10 to the minus 5. This puts the risk category roughly equal to that of a dam, at least the design of a dam, where a failure would cause serious loss of life. For a ship travelling at an imprudent velocity of 9 knots, the minimum safety factor is around 2.1 against line breaking when the passing ship is at the minimum possible separation distance and well in excess of 3 at the most likely passing distance. For the minimum distance scenario and a 9 knot passing velocity, increasing the setback would result in a measurable risk reduction. Although, with a safety factor greater than 2, the, the, the scenario has acceptable risk. For the most likely passing distance and a 9 knot passing velocity, increasing the setback would have a very slight impact on risk reduction, but the risk is already very low and quite acceptable. In conclusion, it can be said that with the present setback, the risks are well within acceptable. Further cutback would not substantially change them. <laughs>